All right. I've been promising you guys, and I hope it lives up to expectations. The discussion of the use of the Shingunto in traditional Japanese swordsmanship practice. And is it a thing you want to try or should try? Now, I'm not talking about Gunto Soho. I'm talking about using one of these in arts that are designed around one of these, a katana. Because, yeah, you can see at first glance, a lot of things I had to adapt to, in some cases overcome, but I don't consider myself master expert, anything like that. Doing this, however, for 45 years, you learn some stuff. Or in this case, in order to proceed, had to learn some stuff. So this is based just on my experience and, and that of some of my fellow students and some things I learned much later when I did finally get exposed to like Gunto Soho or styles of Japanese swordsmanship that are a little better suited to it or maybe to the similar Tachi. So we'll, we'll roll some of that information into here too. But I'm going to split this up into a couple of different sections because I want to address different parts of these things individually as they you know, come into play. So we'll spend a video talking about the blade because, you know, these are usually shorter, more curved, and often heavier than a lot of katana. We'll talk about the differences in the saya because, yeah, that affects how it's worn, carried. It affects drawing and resheathing. We will talk about the differences in the ska. I'll actually start with that today, and then I'll devote a separate video to talking about, well, yeah, this this fun because that's a, that's a whole subject by itself. How to use one of those, not use one of those, and do you even want to have one on your sword? Period. But hopefully, we'll put all those things together, and you can make an informed decision as to whether you know this is this something you want to pursue. Do you already have a gunto? Think about buying a gunto, um, and then maybe use it in swordsmanship practice. So let's get to it. All right, chapter one, let's talk about the ska, shall we? And just looking at these two, you can see immediately the kind of things you're gonna to have to overcome, adapt to, or maybe not be able to. But before we talk about that, I want to address the differences between reproductions and antiques. I've talked about this in other videos where I don't recommend using antique swords, especially not for hard practice, but sometimes not for any practice whatsoever. Why is that? Let's talk about structural integrity, especially when it comes to the ska. Reproductions kind of spoil us that way. Any kind of decent reproduction katana on the market is probably going to be double pin construction. So extra retention, but if, when you pull them apart, you're usually going to find that the nakago, the tang underneath the wooden core here, probably goes down about an inch or two past that lower pin, which means you got metal down to here, sometimes a little bit more. So not only is that extra reinforcement for the sky, it also tends to move the balance point down towards the handle and make the sword just feel more light in hand, period. But you're also talking about, hopefully, materials that are reasonably well fit and intact, not, you know, rotting and cracked and things like that. An antique sword, more commonly, you're going to see single pin. Also, when you pull them apart, it's not unusual to find a short Nakago. About two-thirds of the length maybe less. So not only does that put the blade more weight forward in terms of balance, but there's some wood down here that may not be reinforced by anything but itself. So something to consider, which after years of aging materials in use, it's going to accelerate things splitting, coming apart, failing. You might see some cracking in the scow when you take it apart. You might see some stripping on the Makugiana, the pinhole. That could be getting ready to fail, and then the sword flies apart. The blade comes out of the furniture at the worst possible moment. Well, there really isn't a good one. Other than taking the sword apart intentionally, there's, there's never a good time for the blade to separate from the rest of it. That's catastrophically bad. So, if you've got an antique, pull it apart check on those things and constantly monitor them before you even put it to any, any, any use whatsoever. How does that relate to Gunto? Well, we're talking about antique or reproduction. This is, this is a reproduction. One thing about its structure that is authentic, single pin. However, I'm not worried about it because one, the fit and finish is really good. The materials are really good. There's no cracking, but 
like reproductions, it has spoiled me. The tang, the Nakago, goes down to here. It's almost full length. So a lot more reinforcement moves the balance point back so it feels better in hand. Yeah, I'm a lot more sure with the construction of this. So if you have an original, my original single pin, the cagos are two-third length, but on top of that, there's a lot of wear and tear, aging wood, cracking, uh, stripping of that, you know, Makugi pinhole. So before I use those things at all, I check, 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 make sure I can put it to any use whatsoever without failure. So my recommendation is if you own a Shin Gunto in antique, or if you're thinking about getting one and then thinking about using it for martial arts practice, be super, super cautious about it. Preferably just don't and get yourself one of these to go with it and make this your practice tool. And the other one is your history to preserve. So starting there. All right, so the other functional differences between this and this when you come to using this as this. Well, start with something small. One thing that this reproduction got right in terms of it being authentic and got right in terms of, well, it's the way I was taught and you may have been taught differently or you may have a different preference, but I'm, ta I'm speaking of the position of the Manuki, all right? This is known as the palm orientation, which means the Manuki is, well, if you're using this right-handed, which is traditional training, it's under the palm of your hand. Many modern reproductions, especially katana, use the finger orientation, which means the Manuki is either under your fingers or below your fingers out of the way entirely. Again, your preference may vary, but for me, this Showa-style triple cherry blossom is just the right size and shape to create almost the perfect palm swell for my grip. So I've come to love it. So bonus there. Some other things that you may or may not like about the Gunto versus the Katana. Let's talk about length of ska. Nine and a half to ten and a half inches. Now I have come to like a shorter ska overall. I'm not a big guy, but also you know, just the way I use and maneuver a sword. Now, do I train with these? Yes, absolutely, all the time. Average katana ska, 10 and a half, 11, 11 and a half, 12 inches, sometimes a lot longer. And there are some other factors that influence this in terms of how the blade is, is balanced and, and other things. But in general, with a katana, as the ska gets to 12 inches, it starts to become uncomfortable for me. So. Yeah, it's more in my way than it is functional. So I tend to appreciate the shorter ska. And you may or may not, so consider that. You're going to probably wind up with a shorter ska on any kind of gunto. And in some cases, tachi as well. However, let's talk about the thing that most people find the hardest to adapt to, most uncomfortable. The thing you're looking at right now, the kashira, especially this kabutogane. Now, I'm going to make this a little worse for you. Consider if you are used to using a katana, train with a katana already, have your preferences. Do you have preferences for fit and finish of your kashira? And I'm not calling you a wimp. I'm saying that you're probably training hard with it because, you know, this your left hand is your power hand. It's going to be all the way down at the end of the hilt in most practices, and your lower two fingers are your power fingers, the one that are putting most pressure, torque, leverage, on the sword. So if there are any sharp edges, hot spots on that cap, yeah, they're going to cut into you. You're going to get blisters and then you're not going to want to train. You're going to want a different sword. You're going to want to do something about that. Okay. If that's something that immediately jumps out at you as unpleasant, you're potentially really, really going to hate this. But there are also some upsides to it. Well, let's talk about that. Like I said, I'm going to talk about the tassel in another video, all right? But many antiques, well, not only don't they have the tassel anymore, but a lot of them have lost the lanyard loop, the sarte. It's just gone. Now, this reproduction has what would be considered a common original, which is sculpted. It's very pretty, 
but even more sharp edges than some of the things these were replaced with, which were metal wire ones or maybe cord ones, which would be a little more comfortable onto your hand. This also has one that doesn't have a lot of play in it. It stays on one side of the, of the pommel or the other, so it doesn't rotate all the way around. It doesn't necessarily move out of the way of your grip, but I mean, the simple fact is you're talking about a sword in this case that yeah right where that left hand goes and those bottom two fingers goes there's a there's a thing under your hand now you can kind of use it a little bit like some indian or western swords where the pommel the shape of the pommel is designed to kind of retain your hand keep it from slipping off the end so you can actually just kind of choke down against there but again you get something pressing into the bottom of your hand at the very least now, can you choke up over the top of this entirely? Yes, but you're already talking about a short ska, so now you've made it shorter. And if you've specifically been trained not to leave stuff sticking out the end of your grip, yeah, that's going to be awkward and weird. So you're probably not going to like it. So, could you just remove it? Sure, but you would then still potentially have a grommet through the middle here, so something else sticking out, or just the shape of the kabutogane with all these internal edges. This is the same that you're gonna find on most Tachi as well. If those are sharp, if they're sitting in the wrong place with your fingers, you're gonna not like it. However, there are a couple of real benefits to a Kabutogane. First of all, if you are used to a cap style pommel and you've ever had one, that shall we say wasn't well fit in terms of not well fit to the, the wood of the ska or not well tied down or glued down or whatever and it popped off on you during practice. Just came loose. And then your ito unravels like a slinky. At that point your sword is unusable until it gets repaired and rewrapped. Yeah, you only really need to have that happen to you once before you get real sensitive about the fit and finish of your kashura. But this one, though, in most cases, this isn't going anywhere. If you've got a grommet through the middle of it, that's like a rivet. That's holding it on. If not, well, just so much metal over the wood of the sky is often kind of pinched down over it. A lot more retention. Also, this one is one of the things that gets wrong at least compared to my antiques. On my antiques, the Ito go over this lower bar or through a slot in the lower bar, just like the slot in the cap style Kashirana Katana, right? So an extra piece of retention, multiple points of retention, this isn't going anywhere. It's, it's not coming off without intentional, difficult disassembly, okay? So bonus. Other bonus, if your art includes anything in terms of sukaate, using the pommel as an impact tool, a blunt weapon, whether you're talking about a roundhouse strike or, you know, kind of a, a jab with the butt, this is, this is a heck of an impact tool. Now, I'm not recommending you go out and pound this into like wood and concrete and stuff like I did. And you look at my original yeah, you can see I got a little bit overzealous and um, it's a little bit deformed. We're still talking about brass or copper, right? Soft metal, but it, it can take a lot of abuse and not outrageous abuse, but a lot of abuse and it's, it's not going to fail. It's, it's going to stay put and yeah, you're going to be confident with that. So you are just, if you decide you're going to use something like this, now, obviously, there's a lot of techniques that are designed for a tachi and, and this sword that are a lot more saber-like in terms of just wielding it one-handed and then using your left hand, just like it's used in a number of one-handed or hand-and-a-half swords in other cultures where that left hand becomes kind of an assist. So not quite the same kind of positive leverage that you used to with the left hand on a katana. Kind of half of that. You can, you can use this fairly comfortably, or you can just kind of learn to work your grip around it or over it or whatever. Like I said, you can always take the lanyard loop off. That makes it a little bit easier around some of those edges, makes it a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, um, but it may be just something you find impossible to use. All right, so I hope you found 
this piece of information useful, informative, um, entertaining a little bit, and like I said, to be continued. Hope to see you for those.